Okay, good morning, everyone. This is Dr. Bill with World Bible School, and we are coming to you live from uh, Rolla, Missouri. This is Thursday morning, and um, we're going to continue our lesson today. Welcome to Rightly Dividing Truth, as we've been talking about understanding spirit, soul, and body. Now, I know there's a lot of teachings out there on spirit, soul, and body, and there has been over the last 20, 30 years. But um, I think there's some things that's unique about this teaching. Uh, and, uh, and honestly, I don't know everybody else's teaching, but I just want to share some things with you that I think will be a blessing to you. And particularly today's lesson is going to be powerful. Uh, so I would invite you to uh, like this video, share this video, uh, this broadcast, uh, really, and um, invite someone to watch today. Um, you know, post it on your timeline so your friends can see or uh, specifically invite someone. So uh, we appreciate it today so very much. So in this series, we've been talking about um, giving a biblical explanation and a defining of spirit, soul, and body. There's many people that don't seem to understand the difference between them. Um, and so there's just a lack of understanding when it comes to what came first and how we got here and what we're doing in this earthly realm and so on. Uh, it's not just simple chance that you were born of a mother and father. And, um, you know, all of a sudden there you are. That's that really isn't it at all. I'm not a big fan of a game of chance. But what I do know is that God has a specific plan and a specific purpose for you. So it's important that we have a solid understanding of who God made us to be in all of his dimensions. It's not our dimension, okay? Just because you're in this earthly realm uh, and you're a spirit being. No, God has dimensions that you are a part of. We need to understand those things and how we can interact with him. So let's go back to Genesis 2, verse 7, our text verse. We're only going to read this and just make a couple of comments and then move on to some scriptures today that I think are going to be a real blessing to you and be very insightful as we transition today from talking about the spirit man into the soulish man. So we'll make that transition in our teaching today and then next week we'll continue on with the soul and I have some really really great scriptures coming up next week that'll be a blessing to you so here in Genesis 2 7 it says and the Lord God formed men of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living soul so the reality is, is that if man became a living soul, then we're looking at the breakdown of the pieces of what he was before so that we can begin to understand the spirit, the soul, and the body from a scriptural point of view. I think we've had a lot of teachings. We've had a lot of teachings about psychology, a lot of ministry teachings, a lot of Bible teachings that, that engage psychology. That's not altogether bad. But we need to understand from a scriptural perspective. So the spirit man, which is the real you, who was created in the uh, in Christ Jesus before the foundation of the world. So I, I really want to prove this point today of the spirit man, so we can finalize this and move on into the the soul, because we're only in lesson five, and we really want to get these lessons uh, done in a timely manner. But we also want to be able to show you scriptural evidence of what we're saying. So in Ephesians one verse four and five, it says, "Just as He chose us in Him, in Him meaning Christ, before the foundation of the world." All right, so we were chosen in Christ, we at least know that, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestined us to adoption as by as sons by Jesus Christ himself, to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will. I want to move from here and move on to Ephesians 2, verse 10. We know uh, Ephesians 2, 8, for by grace you've been saved through faith and so on. Um, and uh, how it says that we're, it's not our works, but we're his workmanship. Well, we're going to look at that today. But just keep in mind that there was a cho choosing that took place before the foundation of the world were ever set in place. Now, for God to choose you, he had had some knowledge of you, some foreknowledge, some uh, idea of you. And of course, we've already looked at how that we were created as spirit beings uh, in the in the, uh, the 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 creation of Adam, the forming of Adam, Adam, 
really does mean all mankind. He's a representative or a a a like a first fruits of all creation. So we were created in Adam, but I believe we also existed in God uh, even before that time. And we've looked at all of that. Now Ephesians two ten says, "For we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand." Here the Greek word for beforehand is a uh, a uh, pro uh, Toidsmizo to means to fit up in advance. So God did something in advance. God did something a long time ago, and he said that we should walk in them. So the thing that God did in advance is important that we grasp today. Let's look at this same verse from the Message Bible. It says, no, we neither make nor save ourselves. Think about that. We don't make ourselves, and we don't save ourselves. God does both the making and the saving. He creates each of us by Christ Jesus to join him in the work he does, the good work he has gotten ready for us to do, We work, uh, work we had better be doing. Now, let's think about that a moment, uh, just, just, just for a moment, because I'm about to lay on you some other scriptures that are going to really prove this spirit man thing. But one of the errors that we make is, thinking that if something says we're created in Christ Jesus beforehand, we think that means that created in Christ Jesus uh, when Jesus went to the cross. We fail to grasp the idea that Christ uh, is, is as eternal as the Father is. So what does that mean? Well, what it means is, is that Christ uh, was in the beginning, just like the Father was. If you need a proof of that in Genesis 1-1, you can also go to John chapter 1 and verse 1, and you'll find out that he was the Word, and the Word was in the the beginning, the Word was God, and all of that. So it's important that we get that whatever was done in Christ Jesus before him was also done from before the foundation of the world. And then also something happened when Christ came uh, that and that's that's uh, you know uh, it's kind of like this. We're created in Christ Jesus before the foundation of the world, but when Christ came, we had a grand awakening. Now, of course, you and I weren't there in the beginning when uh, God made Adam and all of that. But the reality is, is we kind of caught up. Okay, we kind of caught up whenever Jesus. Um, whenever Jesus uh, went to the cross, and our soul come into an awareness of who God is. Amen? Okay, now, uh, it's obvious that God had an eternal plan from the beginning, all right, from the beginning of time. And that was when mankind was made in the image and likeness of God. We've looked at those scriptures uh, through the process of forming Adam, the representative of all mankind. But once again, the Bible says in Job 32, 8, but there is a spirit in man and the breath of the Almighty gives him understanding. Now, to think about this, you got to realize that there is a spirit in something. So there's something inside of something else. So man being the, the flesh man, the, the fleshly identity that we have, and the body doesn't uh, have an identity of its own without uh, the information being transferred through the soul, first of all, and we'll be looking at that. Hopefully, we'll be getting into that a lot next week. But, uh, but also in man, there is something else. And the Bible says here, there is a spirit in man. Uh, the breath of God is within the person of mankind. He said, and the breath of the Almighty gives him understanding. So the Greek study helps, does not give us a clear understanding, or even the Hebrew, uh, a clear and distinct picture of the differences between the spirit man and the rational soul. However, we can see here in this verse that the spirit in man seems to show us how that within the whole being of man, there is a spirit. Amen? All right. And that's so important that we understand that. Okay. Now, we are told that this spirit in man, or in the King James, it says the spirit within man is given the ability to understand things by God. That is why God also breathed into mankind 
and he became a living soul, which is your mind, will, intellect, and emotions. Now, I want you to think about this a moment before we go to the next verse. There is a spirit in the whole man, and in the whole man, God breathes that the breath of the Almighty gives him understanding. So there comes your soul. So we see here in Job 32, verse 8, spirit, soul, and body, or spirit, body, and soul, depending on how you want to look at that, okay? <coughs> All right. Now, in Job 32, 18, the writer says these words. He says, for I am full of words. The spirit within me compels me. I want to try to make this as as a as simple as possible because I want us all to be on the same page about this. If there is a spirit within men and that spirit compels me towards something, then how does that work? Because keep in mind that the spirit man is created in the mirrored reflection of God. God gave us a soul so that we can have an understanding of where the body is, what, it's, and what it, it touches in the natural realm. The soul gives us an understanding of the natural realm and of the supernatural realm, okay? So spirit, soul, and body. And I don't have three hands, so you just have to go with me on this. Spirit, soul, and body. But the soul uh, is able to um, uh, uh uh, develop in the things of God as it feeds off of the spirit man. So the spirit within me compels me. Who's the me? Well, my personality isn't necessarily my body. My personality isn't necessarily my spirit man because my human personality, uh, my, my soul man has the personality of God, but my natural man has a different part. All right, everybody hang tight, and I'm going to F5. I'll be right back. One moment, please. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Okay, we're back, and... Um, I hope you can hear me uh, fine. All right. Now, yeah, I can hear it. Okay. So, again, the things of God compel my soulish man. It's drawn into a, 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 a state of transformation, but that also impacts my natural man. So, let me just say this, that a materialist often says that the spirit of man is simply the air he breathes, okay? Now, we've seen the Greek breakdown of that in the scriptures. We know better than that. But they also say that a man's body is all there is to his personality. Yet the Bible says in 1 Thessalonians 5, 23, now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely that and may your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless at the coming of the Lord. Or we could say at the appearing of the Lord, or when we come in contact with the Lord, when we have an awakening in our knowledge of the Lord. So we need to understand that God deals with man in his soul or his personality. I want to say it again this way, that the spirit man is created in the mirrored reflection of God, the whole person of God. The soul has come into a, a an awakening of God. We call that a born again experience. Your soul was born again. Uh, the people will say your human spirit, that's your soul. Your soul was born again. Okay. And so your soul now uh, is your personality and God deals with the personality of man. God doesn't deal with you in your spirit in terms of your spirit man needs to change, uh, even though you can bear witness by your spirit with the Holy Spirit, still your soulish man is that which is being transformed and changed. So if spirit is only meant as breath, then God would not deal with man's personality. So the spirit of man or within man is that which was created by God from before the foundation of the world, but also 
he supernaturally placed into your human feet, into a human fetus, put you there, and he gave you a soul, which is where your personality is found. I hope this is good. I hope this helps somebody. The soulish man has a personality in your mind, okay? And it's recognized in and through your will, intellect, and emotions. Can I say that again? I think this is really good. Your soulish man has a personality in your mind and is recognized in and through your will, intellect, and emotions. The human personality is what makes you different from the lower creation of animal life, all right? Yeah, they might have a warm carcass. They might live and breathe, but they don't have a soul in terms of that which God deals with. God put man here to care for them and so on. All right, now, does the scriptures differentiate between the spirit and soul? We kind of touched on this and been debating that argument with, with what other people say as we've gone along. But I want to give you a few more scriptures as we're transitioning into talking about the soul today. So uh, Hebrews 12 verse 9 says, Furthermore, we have had human fathers who corrected us. How many know that's true? We've corrected our own children. Our parents corrected us. Some of it was good, some of it was not so good, some of it we were okay with, some of it we were not okay with. But we've had human fathers who corrected us, and we paid them respect. Shall we not much more readily be in subjection to the Father of spirits and live? So Paul makes it clear that if we have a human parent or a human father and we respect them, then we should acknowledge that we also have a heavenly father who is the father of spirits, who created uh, the father of spirits. And those spirits were created in his image and his likeness. Romans 1 verse 9 says, for God is my witness whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his son, and uh, that without ceasing I make mention of you always in my prayers. So again, we see I serve with my spirit in the gospel. It, it, is, it is by the spirit of man, the real you, uh, that is motivated or drawn to serve and worship God. So keep in mind that in this earthly system, we use the faculties of our human soul and body to engage in those tasks. To we 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 do them. Let, let me give you another scripture to kind of confirm this. The apostle Paul said once in in First Corinthians fourteen verse fourteen. And if I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, but my understanding is unfruitful. So if I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays. So even though I am speaking words and I'm worshiping God, whether I'm speaking in tongues, whether I'm speaking natural words, and I'm saying, I love you, Father, I worship you, hallelujah, praise your name, Lord. If I do that, where does that come from? Well, that comes from two places. That comes automatically out of me as a spirit man who always wants to worship God and is grateful for the creator, but it also comes out of my will, intellect, and emotions. I worship God. I'm willing to worship God. I have a will to worship God. I have an intellect of what to say, how to, to articulate words. And I also have emotions about it. And sometimes in those motion, emotions, there's joy. Sometimes there's tears. Uh, so there's, there's all kinds of emotions that are expressed as we do that. But it is your spirit man praying by using uh, your vocal cords and your mouth and your soul does not understand what is being prayed when you're praying in tongues, but your soul kind of gets a clue when you're praying in your known tongue, your known language. Now, remember John 4, verse 24, we read it already. It says that God is spirit and those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. Now, that's from the, the uh, New King James. Uh, 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 the, the, the King James says God is a spirit, but in reality, God is spirit, okay? Uh, you say, well, what's the difference? Well, technically, there's not really a lot of difference, but when you say God is a spirit, uh, is just uh, 
it's it's like adding one word or one letter that really doesn't need to be there. God is spirit. All right, in John 4, 24, in the Message Bible, it says, God is sure, sheer being itself. And then it says spirit. Those who worship him must do so, uh, do it out of their very being, their spirits, their true selves in adoration. The word spirit with a capital S uh, and the word spirit with a lowercase s are both the same Greek word. Uh, the word spirit refers to deity with a capital S or the Godhead. Uh, and in, in other uh, words, uh, and the other word spirit with a lowercase s can refer to the life-giving spirit of God in you. So there really is a noticeable difference. So before we move on, let's look at Another portion of scripture uh, in 1 Corinthians 2, verses 9 through 11. Now, we probably have touched on this already, but let's go back and look at it. It says, but at, 1 Corinthians 2, verse 9 through 11. But as it is written, I has not seen, nor ear heard, nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. But God has revealed them to us through his spirit. For the spirit, capital S, Holy Spirit, searches all things, yes, the deep things of God. For what man knows the things of a man except the spirit, the lowercase s, spirit of the man which is in him. And I believe this is referring to uh, the soul here because soul and spirit come from uh, uh, not always the same Greek word, but there's a reference in the, the Greek word suke um, uh, or pneuma uh, that has a, a corresponding meaning. Uh, even so, no one knows the things of God except the spirit of God. So what man knows in his mind comes from the things that a man or from a human comprehension might have, except for that which the spirit of man in man has already known. So does your spirit know all things? The, the answer is yes. Does your soul know all things? The answer is no. But the, again, the, as I've taught in the past, the, the, what I believe the truth is, is that the intention that God has is for your soul to continue to develop in the knowledge of God so that you have an identical match when you look at soul and spirit. They're actually the same thing. Uh, that's that's the ultimate goal. That's the transformation I believe that God is bringing us into. So the things of of that are of God, the, even the deep things of the Spirit, no man knows in and by his natural understanding. The things of the Spirit are revealed to us by the Holy Spirit of God. In Isaiah forty six, uh, reverse that Isaiah sixty four, and verse four, Isaiah sixty four, verse four says. For since the beginning of the world, men have not heard nor perceived by the ear, nor has the eye seen any God beside you who acts for the one who waits for him. So this really is what the Apostle Paul is saying when he talks about the previous passage that we just read. Here's what it says in the Message Bible. Since before time began, no one has ever imagined nor ear heard, nor I, no eye seen a God like you who works for those who wait for him. Someone said even man's soul in its regenerated state has to come to the knowledge of the things of men by the orientation of the spirit of man, which is in him. So in other words, how can my soul gain an understanding of what God is about? How can my soul gain an enlightenment of who God is and who he's designed me to be? Does it come by a natural understanding? The answer is no. Does it come by a supernatural understanding? The answer is yes. But if everything in the supernatural in pertaining to this realm, this natural realm, has to be able to be uh, discerned and, and has to be able to be understood, it happens in your soul. So your soul is coming into the knowledge of truth. Ephesians 2.10 in the Message Bible, once again, I know we already read it, but this is so powerful. No, we neither make nor save ourselves. But uh, God does 
both the making and the saving. He creates each of us by Christ Jesus to join him in the work he does the good uh, the good work he has gotten ready for us to do work we had better be doing so very important so if we have a desire to know certain scientific facts by man's human spirit uh, or properly translated would be by his soul we are enabled to investigate think and weigh the evidences However, the human soul is limited to the things that are known by man. So that's why even if you were a college professor or if you were in, uh, an, uh, 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 in some sort of archaeology or you were in some si sort of medical science program, uh, you would be studying a specific thing, but another area might be completely out of your league. For example, you may be a skilled surgeon and operate on feet and toes and legs, but have no clue when it comes to brain surgery. And the opposite could be true. Same thing with science. You might be an expert in one field of science, but totally uh, be uh, uh, uneducated in another field of science. So if we want to know about the things of God, then our spirit man uh, or spirit uh, uh, be, being full of the knowledge of God releases that information into our soul or mind. I want to go back to uh, Ephesians 2. Uh, I know we just read it, uh, but what we read was verses 2 through 11. Let's look at verses 14 to 15. 1 Corinthians 2, verse 14 and 15 says, But the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him. Or in other words, they just don't make sense to the natural man, nor can he know them because they're spiritually discerned. Discerned is a really powerful word here. We're not going to get into this, but the point is, is that to know the things that are of the Spirit of God takes a supernatural understanding. Now, that natural supernatural understanding can be imparted to your soul as your soul is able to comprehend it. But this goes on to say, but he who is spiritual judges all things, yet he himself is rightly judged by no one. For who has known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him? but we have the mind of Christ. So how do we access the supernatural things of God? Well, that's because and the, the, through the medium of uh, that God has placed uh, the mind of Christ in us. So we have the mind of Christ. Very important that we understand that. So the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God. The reason is, is the Bible says they are foolishness to him, because those things are supernaturally or spiritually discerned and not naturally discerned. Now, what some translators interpret as the human spirit, I believe that it should be translated the human rational soul, particularly from the Greek word pneuma, uh, where this, which would, has a variety of meanings and applications, very powerful word. Just to understand this, when you're reading Greek and Hebrew, Every definition in that word, under that word, doesn't necessarily fit the context of that passage, which is why those words are used over and over and over and over again. So how do I know what con what belongs to what context in Scripture? Well, that's where the Holy Spirit comes in and just spending time with him and uh, and doing our best to get it right. So when we properly apply those meanings to the context of Scripture, it seems that any reference to the human spirit is also referring to the human rational soul. So here's the thing. Uh, to understand uh, and, and, and for understanding uh, uh, to come from the spirit realm, what seems to happen in our understanding is what some refer to as the spark of regeneration before there is an actual understanding of the things of God. So do we have the ability to understand the things of God? The answer is yes, we absolutely have the ability, but it's because our spirit man is already enlightened. Amen. It's very, very important that we understand that. Uh, the spirit man being enlightened uh, means that the spirit man already has the information of God stored away inside 
in the mind of Christ, which is in you. Amen. We all have the mind of Christ in us. But the thing is, is that many people have not accessed that mind. Now, some say that the that man's spiritual nature must be renewed before there is a true conception of godliness or the things of God. Well, here's the thing. The only thing that keeps us from knowing the deep things of the spirit is our own soulish will. And when this trans, uh, transaction of knowledge takes place in us, something supernatural happens, even when we do not recognize it. Before I go on, and, and I've got a, a, a wonderful conclusion to today's lesson, let me just say this. Have you ever lost something? Now, the most common thing in America is for someone to lose their car keys, okay? Have you ever panicked and searched all day and sometimes didn't find until the next day or even longer than that? Well, let me ask you this. Have you ever lost your car keys and realized it and immediately just stopped and said, okay, Holy Spirit, where are my car keys? I really need them. Can you help me with this? And all of a sudden there is uh, uh, something happens. Uh, you move a pillow, there they are. Uh, you, you, you search in the same place they were before. You found them in the pocket of your coat uh, that you just kind of overlooked. I mean, something super simple took place and you were able to find them. So it's important that we also pursue knowledge in the same way. The knowledge is here. It's already stored up. This is who God is. This is what God's about. He created you in the mirrored reflection of himself. And that knowledge has to be transmitted into your soul, into your natural understanding, so you can open up your eyes to it and say, I get it, okay? And then that whole process has an impact on your natural body. Uh, re remember, we quoted uh, last time, I think, or the time before, Third John verse 2, that says, Beloved, I desire that you prosper and be in health, even as or in equal proportion to your soul prospering. So we want our finances to prosper. We want our jobs to prosper. We want our bodies to prosper, our health to prosper. But this comes because we're accessing the knowledge of God and our soul is prospering. The Bible says in Romans 8, verse 16, uh, the spirit bear himself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. So we receive a witness from the Holy Spirit out of our spirit man into the soulish man. OK, and so what we find here is that uh, in principle, if the Holy Spirit witnesses to you that you are a child of God, then he also witnesses to you the knowledge of God into the realm of your understanding. Come on, somebody. Let me say that again. This is just the principle of this verse. This is how this would work in principle. If the Holy Spirit witnesses to you, that you have this feeling on the inside, this knowing on the inside, uh, that you are a child of God, then he also witnesses to you the knowledge of God into the realm of your understanding. So you don't get a thing. You don't understand it. You've been wringing your hands over it. I'm just not understanding. Holy Spirit, what's the deal with this? And all of a sudden, here's this knowledge is released into your spirit, man, from your spirit, man, into your soul. And now you say, I get it. Okay. All right. So the soul of man. And I want to transition into this uh, now that we've kind of flowed out of talking about the spirit man and now coming into the realm of the soulish man. The soul man, soul of man, sometimes uh, translated as the um, the spirit of man. It's not the spirit of man, okay? Not as in your spirit being, but sometimes that's the way it's translated, okay? Uh, the soul of man refers to that inner part of you where you think, feel, and have emotions. You say, Dr. Bill, is it really okay to have emotions? God made us with wonderful emotions. Amen? And, uh, and so the fact that we have emotions uh, means that we're able to use them. And God gave them to us. You know, you say, are all emotions good? Well, uh, you know, the truth is there are emotions that uh, maybe uh, are not as good as we'd like them to be, that they, they kind of, uh, um, uh, you know, deceive us, so to speak. But, hey, emotions can be a very good thing. And so thank God for them. Okay, now, 
let's uh, let's look at this. We talked about earlier uh, in our beginning, and and since we're going to transition into the teaching about the soul, uh, then we want to go back and just touch on Genesis two seven. That said, the Lord God formed man out of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and he became a living being. The words living being is also translated living soul. Just depends on uh, the translation of the Bible you look at, but it's also based on uh, that when you look at the original language. So it's important that we do not confuse that which is truly spiritual and supernatural with, with that which is merely soulish and physical. Very important. It's important that we also understand the difference. So as we get into this uh, today, you know, our, our uh, are, are winding down. Uh, let, let me share this with you about. We've got a few scriptures, but let me share this with you about the, the this. We, we've seen how the spirit of man is the sphere or the realm of activity where the Holy Spirit operates. And I, I read that uh, by someone, and I kind of uh, uh, reworded it into something that really flowed in my vocabulary. But basically, this is a great definition. The spirit of man is a sphere or a realm of activity where the Holy Spirit operates. And one area of operation of the Spirit, a Holy Spirit, is his work of regeneration. Notice what Romans 8, 11 says. But if the Spirit of him who raised Christ Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through the Spirit who dwells in you. This is the work of regeneration in the body and of the mind, uh, which God wants to prosper and advance you in. This is extremely, and I want to just say it again, extremely important, extremely important that we get this. The Holy Spirit on the inside of us continuously regenerates our body and our mind, and we need to pull off of that. We need to um, take advantage of that, so to speak and receive from that regeneration. Uh, the Bible says again in 3 John verse 2, I want to read this from the God's Word translation. It says, dear friend, I want you to know that uh, I want, I know that you are spiritually well. And that's a great statement. When it comes to being a spirit being, everything's cool. I pray that you're doing well in, other er uh, in every other way and that you're healthy. The Message Bible says, we're the best of friends, and I pray for good fortune in everything you do and for your good health, that your everyday affairs prosper as well as your soul. So the soul, to take the definition we used about the spirit being, the soul is the, the sphere or realm of activity where the enemy, I wanna, I'm going to use this word enemy very loosely, and then I'm going to very lightly that I'm going to explain, where the enemy of your mind operates, attempts to cause you to value other things over and above God. This would be anything that, when we talk about an enemy, we're not talking about a person, but just listen to this. It's, it's anything that appeals to the affections or emotions of man's carnal nature. So to understand what influences the soul of man, we at least need to understand who Satan or the devil is from the original language. Now, some of you have heard me teach on this before. Uh, the first thing we want to understand is the serpent of old in Genesis 1, verse 3. And we're not going to read that necessarily, but I want you to understand the Bible talks about that serpent of old who beguiled or deceived Eve, compelled Eve. This serpent was commanded by God from that action to crawl on its belly all the days of its life. Now, let me ask you a question. Let's lay aside for the moment trying to define what this serpent is. Let's try. Let's not try to define whether this serpent is a, a devil or Satan or an evil being. Let's evil spirit. Let's lay that aside and let's just realize this. Notice this in, in the Genesis 3 14 in the New Living Translation. Then the Lord God said to the servant, Because you have done this, you are cursed more than all animals, domestic and wild. Isn't it amazing that God put this serpent uh, in the category of? of animals, domestic and wild, but not in the category of human beings. Isn't that amazing? Now, 
he said, you will crawl on your belly, groveling in the dust as long as you live. The first thing about the serpent in the garden that we want to understand is, according to the Hebrew language, this serpent was only able to speak to Eve in her mind, but not in an audible voice. That's the first thing. The second thing is the definition of the serpent in the Hebrew language is a snake. So let's just say there was a time when man could communicate with, with animals on a uh, like mental telepathy type of a of, of, um, uh, of, of plane. Uh, now, not everybody wants to embrace that. I'm not saying this is a, a, a great theological discovery, but I'm saying according to the Hebrew language, this was how the snake was able to communicate with Eve and Eve back to the snake, which was on a, 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 a mental level. All right, I'm going to refresh my screen, folks. Hang on right there. Okay, we're back. Now, uh, I have worked on my computer. I don't know what this problem is, why this happens, but, um, you know, we're still trying to fix it. Okay. All right. Now, so if the Hebrew language is right, and it's obvious that it is, no matter what the English language says, we have to go with the Hebrew language. And if we can grasp this, that this snake was able to communicate with Eve on that on a mental level, like mental telepathy or a, 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 a telepathic type uh, communication. And God says, you're cursed more than all animals, domestic and wild. And the snake is on the same level as the, the animal life. Then it is conceivable that mankind and, and we and Adam and Eve could communicate with the animal life in a, a, a telepathic type communication. However, again, God does not place this snake, this serpent in the garden as anything more than um, uh, uh, a lower life form. Now, God tells him, you will crawl on your belly. How long? Somebody out there. How long did God say this serpent would crawl on its belly? From Genesis chapter three, nearly the beginning of the Bible. All the days of his life. Isn't that right? Okay. So the cross was just a, 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 a ratifying, a putting the seal on it, uh, uh, kind of like, hey, you know what? You remember what happened in the garden? It, that's all it was. And so we don't have this enemy that can rise up and, uh, and make us sick or cause car wrecks or cause the steering wheel to fly out of your hand or cause a gun to go off. We need to quit blaming the devil for that kind of stuff and take responsibility. The thing that the serpent of the garden could do was to speak to Eve in her mind. Now, notice how that God devalues this serpent by saying you're cursed more than any beast, beast of the field. Uh, not humans, okay? Here's a kind of a, a backing up of the same thing, and that is in John 10, verse 10. I want to show you something that is so valuable, and I want to say it today in a way that you've probably never heard me say it before. <clears throat> John 10, 10 says, The thief does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy. The second sentence says, I have come, Jesus, that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. One of the mistakes that's made in biblical literature is that we instantly assume the thief here means Satan. Yet this passage, if you read John 10, is really about the good shepherd. It's really about Jesus and how he interacts with his sheep and so on. It's not about the thief, okay? There's always the possibility of a thief. Uh, coming, what what kind of thief? Let me ask you. What kind of key, key, uh, uh, thief uh, comes against natural uh, a natural herd of sheep? It's a, a wolf or a fox or something like that. Correct. Okay. So in biblical literature, when
we're talking about the bleeding. They'll say Satan comes to kill. We're going to the devil of the law in that day. Now, please understand this. John 10, 10, again, is not talking about Satan. John 10, 10 is talking about the thief. The thief and Satan are not the same thing in this passage, okay? We want to clearly and clearly, clearly, clearly understand this, amen? We need to understand this, okay? Now, um, okay, I, I hope I didn't lose anybody. The recording, I hope, is good. Um, but in the context of this passage, it is revealed in the previous chapter that Jesus was talking to a group of people. And the group of people he was talking to was the Pharisees. So what do you think he was teaching these teachers of the law or talking about when it comes to these teachers of the law? He was talking to his sheep about the thief. He was talking to his sheep about the conversation he had with the Pharisees, who were not only the teachers of the law, but they brought confusion to the Jewish people that Jesus was trying to reach in that day. First Peter 5, verse 8 in the God's Word translation, you know this scripture. It says, keep your mind clear and be alert. Your opponent, the devil, is prowling around like a roaring lion, and he looks for someone to devour. You've heard these words. You've heard it from the King James. You've heard it from all kinds of translations. But what we fail to hear is that the Greek and Hebrew definition, that we fail to hear the voice of the original language. And the word devil here is the Greek in the Greek language is translated as the false accuser and slanderer. And the, this enemy that's being spoken of in scripture knows how to dominate the psychological mind or soul of man. Okay, that's it. Now, <coughs> I'm going to tell you who the enemy is, okay? Because that's what we're dealing with when it comes to the soul of man. And next week, we're going to get into this. We're going to define the enemy that's actually messing with your head. This enemy knows how to mess with the psychological mind of mankind. So the only way your life can come under any type of attack, and I hate that word attack, is for there to be confusion in your thinking about what is right according to what you feel or what God says and thinks. So is your thinking right if there's confusion and etc., Or is God's thinking right? where there's peace and grace. It's like the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. I call the tree of the knowledge of good and evil a type of the arm of the flesh. Always deciding, do I do right or do I do good? Do I go right or do I do left? It's kind of like the battle of which way do we go? Well, let's come back to this next time and look more at what's going on within the soul of man, because I'll be start, uh, bringing right in the early part of my lesson next week about what exactly is happening when your mind is in confusion, when there's a battle going on, when you don't know what to do, what is actually going on? Does the Bible tell us? Well, let me give you a little clue about next time. The answer is yes. The Bible makes it crystal clear what is going on in our understanding. Amen? Or in our mind, in, in, and it can be lack of understanding, okay? Uh, when when we sense God coming on the scene or ministering to us in that setting, what happens? What we do is we begin to understand and we enter into the rest that he has already provided for us. Amen? So we're getting a little deeper into this thing. We're getting into the soul now in the realm of understanding, and this is really good. And next time is just going to be even better. So I want to thank everyone for watching me today. I apologize for the interruptions of the fuzzy voice or uh, any problem with the video. Uh, I'll check it out and make sure it's good. But uh, thank you for watching. I hope you've learned something that will help you get on track or at least keep you on track uh, with the truths in the heart of God 
which is present day truth. Amen. So join me next time for another exciting episode of Rightly Dividing Truth because knowing truth will set you free and keep you free. Amen. I'll see you next time. Bye-bye, everyone.